This audio is recorded by John Loth. It's intended for educational purposes. If you find value in these works, and if you'd like to assist me in the production of these recordings, head over to my website where you can donate as little as $1 to help me continue making these. I really appreciate all your help. Thanks for having a look and a listen. Your friend, John Loth. Tragedy and Hope A History of the World in Our Time by Carol Quigley Chapter 13 Part 2 The Czechoslovak Crisis 1937-1938 Czechoslovakia was the most prosperous, most democratic, most powerful, and best administered of the states which arose on the ruins of the Habsburg Empire. As created in 1919, this country was shaped like a tadpole and was made up of four main portions. These were, from west to east, Bohemia, Moravia, Slovakia, and Ruthenia. It had a population of 15 million, of which 3,400,000 were Germans, 6 million were Czechs, 3 million were Slovaks, 750,000 were Hungarians, 100,000 were Poles, and 500,000 were Ruthenians. In general, these people lived on a higher level of education, culture, economic life, and progressiveness. As we move from east to west, the Germans and Czechs begin on a high level, while the Slovaks and Ruthenians were on a lower level. The large number of minorities, and especially the large number of Germans, arose from the need to give the country defensible and viable frontiers. On the northwest, the obvious strategic frontier was along the Sudeten Mountains, and, to secure this, it was necessary to put into Czechoslovakia the large number of Germans on the south side of these mountains. These Germans objected to this, although they had never been part of Germany itself, because they regarded all Slavs as inferior people, and because their economic position was threatened. The Sudeten area had been the most industrialized portion of the Habsburg Empire, and found its markets restricted by the new territorial divisions. Moreover, the agrarian reforms of the new republic, while not aimed at the Germans, injured them more than others just because they had formed an upper class. This economic discontent became stronger after the onset of the World Depression in 1929, and especially after Hitler demonstrated that his policies could bring prosperity to Germany. On the other hand, the minorities of Czechoslovakia were the best-treated minorities in Europe, and their agitations were noticeable precisely because they were living in a democratic liberal state which gave them the freedom to agitate. Among the Germans of the Sudeten, only part were Nazis, but these were noisy, well-organized, and financed from Berlin. Their numbers grew steadily, especially after the Austrian Anschluss. The Nazi party in Czechoslovakia was banned, in 1934, but under Konrad Hinlin merely changed its name to the Sudeten German Party. With 600,000 members, it polled 1,200,000 votes in the election of May 1935 and obtained 44 seats in the parliament, only one less than the largest party. As soon as Edward Benes succeeded Thomas Masiarch as president of Czechoslovakia in 1935, he took steps to conciliate the Sudentans, offering them, for example, places in the administration proportionate to their percentage of the total population. This was not acceptable to the Germans because it would have given them only one-fifth of the places in their own area, where they were over 90% of the population, as well as one-fifth in Slovakia, where they had no interest at all. In 1937, the Prime Minister, Milan Hodza offered to transfer all the Germans and the national administration to the Sudeten areas and to train others until the whole bureaucracy in these areas was German. None of these suggestions was acceptable to Konrad Hinlin for the simple reason that he wanted no concessions within Czechoslovakia, however extensive. His real desire was to destroy the Czechoslovak state. Since he could not admit this publicly, Although he did admit it in his letters to Hitler in 1937, he had to continue to negotiate, 
raising his demands as the government made larger concessions. These concessions were a danger to the state because the fortified zone against Germany ran along the mountains and thus right through the Sudetenland. Every concession to the Sudetens thus weakened the country's ability to defend itself against attack. These two facts made all efforts to compromise with Henlin futile from the beginning, and made the constant British pressure on the Czech government to give additional concessions worse than futile. It is worthy to note that no public demand was made by either Henlin or Germany to detach the Sudetenland from Czechoslovakia until after September 12. 1938. Although influential persons in the British government were advocating this, both in public and private, for months before this date. The Czech strength rested on its army of approximately 33 divisions, which was the best in Europe in quality, the excellent fortification system, and its alliances with France, the Soviet Union, and the Little Entente. The annexation of Austria surrounded Bohemia with German territory, on three sides, but its position, from a military point of view, was still strong. A line drawn from Berlin to Vienna would pass by Prague, but the German army could not safely invade Bohemia across its weakly fortified southern frontier with Austria because of the danger of a Czech counterattack from its fortified base into Bavaria. Within two weeks of Hitler's annexation of Austria, Britain was moving. It was decided to put pressure on the Czechs to make concessions to the Germans, to encourage France and eventually Germany to do the same, to insist that Germany must not use force to reach a decision, but to have patience enough to allow negotiations to achieve the same result, and to exclude Russia, although it was allied to Czechoslovakia, from the negotiations completely. All this was justified by the arguments that Czechoslovakia in a war with Germany would be smashed immediately, that Russia was of no military value whatever, and would not honor its alliance with the Czechs anyway, and that Germany would be satisfied if it obtained the Sudetenland and the Polish Corridor. All these assumptions were very dubious, but they were assiduously propagated both in public and in private, and may, at times, even have convinced the speakers themselves. The group which spread this version of the situation included Chamberlain, Lord Halifax, John Simon, Samuel Hoare, Horace Wilson, the Cliveden Set, the British Ambassador in Berlin, Sir Nivelle Henderson, and the British Minister in Prague, Basil Newton. To make their aims more appealing, they emphasized the virtues of autonomy and self-determination, and the contribution to European peace which would arise if Germany were satisfied and if Czechoslovakia were neutralized, like Switzerland, and guaranteed like Belgium. By neutralization, they meant that Czechoslovakia must renounce its alliances with the Soviet Union and with France. By guaranteed, they meant that the rump of Czechoslovakia, which was left after the Sudetenland went to Germany, would be guaranteed by France and Germany, but emphatically not by Britain. How Czechoslovakia could be guaranteed against Germany by France alone after its defenses has been destroyed, when it could not, according to Britain, be defended in 1938, when its defenses were intact, and when it would be supported by France, the Soviet Union, and Britain, is only one of the numerous British illogicalities displayed in this crisis. Nevertheless, Britain was able to win support for these plans, especially in France, where Foreign Minister George Bonnet and Prime Minister Edouard Daladier reluctantly accepted them. In France, fear of war was rampant. Moreover, in France, even more obviously than in England, fear of Bolshevism was a powerful factor, especially in influential circles of the right. The ending of the Soviet alliance the achievement of a four-power pact and the termination of Czechoslovakia as a spearhead of Bolshevism in Central Europe had considerable appeal to those conservative circles which regarded the popular front government of Leon Blum as a spearhead of Bolshevism in France itself. To this group, as to a less vociferous group in Britain, even a victory over Hitler in war to save Czechoslovakia 
would have been a defeat for their aims. Not so much because they disliked democracy and admired authoritarian reaction, which was true, as because they were convinced that the defeat of Hitler would expose all of Central and perhaps Western Europe to Bolshevism and chaos. The slogan of these people, Better Hitler Than Bloom, became increasingly prevalent in the course of 1938, and, although nothing quite like this was heard in Britain, the idea behind it was not absent from that country. In this dilemma, the three-world bloc of the Cliveden set, or even the German-Soviet war of the anti-Bolsheviks, seemed to be the only solution, because both required the elimination of Czechoslovakia from the European power system. Czechoslovakia was eliminated with the help of German aggression, French indecision and war wariness, and British public appeasement and merciless secret pressure. There is no need to follow the interminable negotiations between Hinlin and the Czech government. Negotiations in which Britain took an active role from March 1938 to the end. Plan after plan for minority rights, economic concessions, cultural and administrative autonomy, and even political federalism were produced by the Czechs, submitted to Britain and Germany, and eventually brushed aside as inadequate by Hinlin. The latter's Karlsbad demands, enunciated on April 24th after Henlin's conference with Hitler, were extreme. They began with an introduction denouncing the Czechs and the Czechoslovak state, insisting that the country must abandon its foreign policy and cease to be an obstacle to the German drive to the east. Then they enumerated eight demands. Among these we find 1. Complete equality between Czechs and Germans. 2. Recognition of the German group as a corporation with legal personality. 3. Demarcation of the German areas. 4. Full self-government in those areas. 5. Legal protection for citizens outside those areas. 6. Reparation for damages inflicted by the Czechs on the Sudentans since 1918. 7. German officials in German areas. And 8. Full freedom to profess German nationality and German political philosophy. There is here no hint of revision of the frontiers. Yet, when, after long weeks of negotiations, the Czech government substantially conceded these points under severe pressure from Britain, Henlin broke off the negotiations and fled to Germany, September the 7th through the 12th, 1938. As early as March 17th, 1938, five days after the Anschluss, the Soviet government called for consultations, looking toward collective actions, to stop aggression and to eliminate the increased danger of a new world slaughter. This was summarily rejected by Lord Halifax. Instead, on March 24th, Chamberlain announced in the House of Commons Britain's refusal to pledge aid to the Czechs if they were attacked or to France if it came to their rescue. When the Soviet request was repeated in September 1938, it was ignored. The French Prime Minister and the French Foreign Minister went to London at the end of April and tried to get Britain to agree to three things. 1. Naval conversations aiming to ensure France's ability to transport its African troops to France in a crisis. 2. Economic support for the Little Entente to save them from German economic pressure. And 3. A promise that if Anglo-French pressure on Czechoslovakia resulted in extensive concessions to the Sudentans, and Germany then refused the concessions and tried to destroy the Czech state, an Anglo-French guarantee would then be given to Czechoslovakia. The first two of these were postponed, and the third was refused. It was also made clear to the French that in the event of any British-French war against Germany, Britain's contribution to this joint effort would be restricted to the air, since this was the only way in which Britain itself could be attacked, although it might be possible at some time to send two divisions to France. When the French tried to obtain assurance that these two divisions would be motorized, it was reiterated that these units were not being promised, but were merely a possible future contribution, 
and that no assurance could be given that they would be motorized. The violence of these Anglo-French discussions is not reflected in the minutes published by the British government in 1949. The day after they ended, Chamberlain wrote to his sister, quote, Fortunately, the papers have had no hint of how near we came to a break with the French over Czechoslovakia. Closed quote. It is clear from the evidence that Chamberlain was determined to write off the Sudentenland and not to go to war with Germany unless public opinion in England compelled it. In fact, he felt that Germany could impose its will upon Czechoslovakia by economic pressure alone. Although he did not go so far as to say, with Sir Nivelle Henderson and Lord Halifax, that this method could be successful, quote, in a short time, if Germany adopted this course, close quote. According to Chamberlain, no casus belli would then arise under the terms of the French-Czechoslovak Treaty, and Germany would be able to accomplish everything she required without moving a single soldier. If Germany did decide to destroy Czechoslovakia, he did not see how this could be prevented, but he did not believe that Germany wanted to destroy Czechoslovakia. Accordingly, by putting Anglo-French pressure on the Czechs to negotiate, it would be possible to save something of Czechoslovakia, and in particular, to save the existence of the Czechoslovak state. In any case, he was determined not to go to war over it, because nothing could prevent Germany from achieving immediate victory over the Czechs, and even if the Germans were subsequently defeated after a long war, there was no guarantee that Czechoslovakia could be re-established in its existing form. Chamberlain's point of view, which was the decisive force in the whole crisis, was presented in more positive terms to a group of North American journalists at a luncheon on Lady Astor's house on May 10, 1938. He wanted a four-power pact, the exclusion of Russia from Europe, and frontier revisions of Czechoslovakia in favor of Germany. Since these things could not be obtained immediately, he kept up the intense diplomatic pressure on Czechoslovakia to make concessions to the Sudeten Germans. Under French pressure, he also asked Germany what it wanted in this problem. But until September, obtained no answer, on the grounds that this was a question to be settled by the Sudetens and the Czechs. In the meantime, the German occupation of Austria changed the strategic situation for Germany, so that it was necessary for Hitler to modify his general order to the armed forces for operational plans against France, Czechoslovakia, and Austria. These orders had been insisted on June 24, 1937. These orders had been issued on June 24, 1937. The new directive, as drafted by General Keitel on May 20, 1938, and submitted for Hitler's signature, began, quote, It is not my intention to smash Czechoslovakia by military action in the immediate future without provocation, unless an unavoidable development of the political conditions within Czechoslovakia forces the issue, or political events in Europe create a particularly favorable opportunity, which may perhaps never recur. Close quote. This draft was entirely rewritten by Hitler and signed on May 30th, 1938. Its opening sentence then read, quote, It is my unalterable decision to smash Czechoslovakia by military action in the near future. Close quote. It then went on to say that in case of war with Czechoslovakia, whether France intervened or not, all forces would be concentrated on the Czechs in order to achieve an impressive success in the first three days. The general strategic plan, based on this order, provided that forces would be transferred to the French frontier only after a decisive blow against Czechoslovakia. No provision was made for war against the Soviet Union, except for naval activity in the Baltic, and all regular forces were to be withdrawn from East Prussia in order to speed up the defeat of the Czechs. X day was set for October 1st, with deployment of troops to begin on September 28th. These orders were so unrealistic that the German military leaders were aghast. They realized that the reality was so different from Hitler's picture of it that Germany would be defeated fairly readily 
in any war likely to arise over Czechoslovakia. All their efforts to make Hitler see the reality were completely unsuccessful, and, as the crisis continued, they became more and more desperate, until by the end of August they were in a panic. This feeling was shared by the whole foreign ministry, except Ribbentrop himself. Hitler was isolated in his mountain retreat, living in a dream world, and very short-tempered. He was cut off from outside contacts by Ribbentrop, Himmler, and Hess, who told him that Russia, France, and Britain would not fight, and that the Czechs were bluffing. One of the mysteries yet remaining is why Ribbentrop was so sure that, that Britain would not fight. He was right. The German generals tried to dissuade Hitler from his project, and when they found that they had no influence over him, they persuaded various important people who saw him to intervene for the same purpose. Thus, they were able to get Admiral Miklos Horthy, regent of Hungary, to try to influence the Fuhrer during his visit of August 21st through the 26th. 1938. Hitler interrupted by shouting, Nonsense! Shut up! The generals and several important civil leaders then formed a conspiracy led by General Ludwig Beck, chief of the general staff. All the important generals were in it, including Erring Witzelben, governor of Berlin, and General George Thomas, chief of supply. Among the civil leaders were Baron Ernst von Weissacker, State Secretary in the Foreign Ministry, Eric Kort, Head of Rubentrop's Office, and Ehrlich von Hassel, Ambassador to Rome, 1932-1938. Their plot had three stages in it. 1. To exert every effort to make Hitler see the truth. 2. To inform the British of their efforts to beg them to stand firm on the Czechoslovak issue and to tell the German government that Britain would fight if Hitler made war on Czechoslovakia. 3. To assassinate Hitler if he nevertheless issued the order to attack Czechoslovakia. Although message after message was sent to Britain in the first two weeks of September, by Weissacker and Court, by the generals and by others in separate missions, the British refused to cooperate. As a result, the plan was made to assassinate Hitler as soon as the attack was ordered. This project was cancelled at noon on September 28, 1938, when news reached Berlin that Chamberlain was going to Munich to yield. The attack order was to have been given by Hitler at 2 p.m. that day. In the meantime, the Czechs were negotiating with Konrad Hinlin in an effort to reach some compromise less radical than his Karlsbad demands. Pressure was exercised on the Czechs by Britain and France. From May 31st onward, Lord Halifax tried to force France to threaten the Czechs that their alliance would be revoked or at least weakened if they did not make concessions to the Sudentans. This threat was finally made on September 21, 1938. The pressure on the Czechs was greatly increased by the sending of a British mission under Lord Runciman to Czechoslovakia at the beginning of August. This mission was presented to the public as being sent to mediate between Hinlin and the government at the request of the Czech government. In fact, it was imposed on the Czech government, and its chief function was to increase the pressure on that government and to make concessions. It was publicly announced that the members of the mission went as private persons and that the British government was not bound by anything which they did. Under this pressure, the Czechs yielded little by little, and, as already stated, conceded the essence of the Carlsbad demands on September 6th. Since the Sudeten leaders did not want any settlement which would not ensure the destruction of Czechoslovakia, they instigated a street riot and broke off negotiations. The official British investigation reported that the riot in question was entirely the fault of the Sudeten leaders, who had attacked a policeman. In the meantime, the British had been working out a plan of their own. It involved, as we have said, 1. Separation of the Sudetenland from Czechoslovakia, probably through the use of a plebiscite or even by outright partition. 2. Neutralization of the rest of Czechoslovakia by revising her treaties with Russia and France.
and three, guarantee of this rump of Czechoslovakia, but not by Britain. This plan was outlined to the Czech ambassador in London by Lord Halifax on May 25th and was worked out in some detail by one of Lord Halifax's subordinates, William, now Lord Strang, during a visit to Prague and to Berlin in the following week. This was the plan which was picked up by Lord Runciman and presented as his recommendation in his report of September 21st, 1938. It is worthy of note that on September 2nd, Lord Runciman sent a personal message by Henlin to Hitler, in which he said that he would have a settlement drawn up by September 15th. What is, perhaps, surprising is that Lord Runciman made no use whatever of the Carlsbad demands or the extensive concessions to meet them which the Czechs had made during these negotiations, but instead recommended to the British cabinet on September 16th and in his written report five days later, the same melange of partition, plebiscites, neutralization, and guarantee, which had been in the mind of the British Foreign Office for weeks. It was this plan which was imposed on the Czechs by the Four Power Conference at Munich on September 30th. It was also necessary to impose this plan on the French government and on the public opinion of the world, especially on the public opinion of England. This was done by means of the slowly mounting war scare, which reached the level of absolute panic on September 28th. The mounting horror of the relentless German mobilization was built up day by day, while Britain and France ordered the Czechs not to mobilize in order not to provoke Germany. The word was assiduously spread on all sides that Russia was worthless and would not fight, that Britain certainly would not go to war to prevent the Sudentans from exercising the democratic right of self-determination, that Germany could overwhelm the Czechs in a few days and could wipe out Prague, Paris, and London from the air in the first day, that these air attacks would be accompanied by gas attacks on the civilian population from the air, and that, even if Germany could be defeated after years of war, Czechoslovakia would never be reconstructed because it was an artificial monstrosity, an aberration of 1919. We now know that all these statements and rumors were not true. The documentary evidence indicates that the British government knew that they were not true at the time. Germany had 22 partly trained divisions on the Czech frontier, while the Czechs had 17 first line and 11 other divisions, which were superior from every point of view except air support. In addition, they had excellent fortifications and higher morale. These facts were known to the British government. On September 3rd, the British military attaché in Prague wrote to London that there are no shortcomings in the Czech army as far as I have been able to observe, which are of sufficient consequence to warrant a belief that it cannot give a good account of itself, even fighting alone. In my view, therefore, there is no material reason why they should not put up a really protracted resistance single-handedly. It all depends on their morale. The fact that the Germans were going to attack with only 22 divisions was reported to London by the military attaché on September 21st. The fact that Russia had at least 97 divisions and over 5,000 planes had been reported by the attaché in Moscow, although he had a very low opinion of both. The fact that Russia sold 36 of their latest model fighting planes to Czechoslovakia was also known. That Russia would fight if France fought was denied at the time, but it is now clear that Russia had assured everyone that it would stand by its treaty obligations. In 1950, it was revealed by President Benes that Russia had put every pressure on him to resist the German demands in September 1938. Similar pressure was put on France, a fact which was reported to London at the time. By the third week of September, Czechoslovakia had one million men and 34 divisions under arms. The Germans, in the course of September, increased their mobilization to 31 and ultimately to 36 divisions. 
but this probably represented a smaller force than that of the Czechs, as many of the 19 first line divisions were at only two thirds strength, the other one third having been used as a nucleus to form the reserve divisions. Of the 19 first line divisions, three were armored and four were motorized. Only five divisions were left on the French frontier in order to overcome Czechoslovakia as quickly as possible. France, which did not completely mobilize, had the Mignon line completely manned on a war basis, plus more than 20 infantry divisions. Moreover, France had available 10 motorized divisions. In air power, the Germans had a slight edge in average quality, but in numbers of planes, it was far inferior. Germany had 1,500 planes, while Czechoslovakia had less than a 1,000. France and England together had over a 1,000. Russia is reported to have had 5,000. Moreover, Russia had about 100 divisions. While these could not be used against Germany, because Poland and Romania would not allow them to pass over their territory, they would have been a threat to persuade Poland to remain neutral and to bring Romania to support Czechoslovakia in keeping the Little Entente intact and thus keeping Hungary neutral. With Poland and Hungary both neutral, there is no doubt that Germany would have been isolated. The neutrality of Poland and Romania would not have prevented the Russian Air Force from helping Czechoslovakia, and if worse came to worse, Russia could have overrun East Prussia across the Baltic states and from the Baltic Sea since it had been almost completely denuded of regular German air forces. It is quite clear that Italy would not have fought for Germany. The evidence shows that the Chamberlain government knew these facts, but consistently gave a contrary impression. Lord Halifax particularly distorted the facts. Although all reports indicate that the morale of the Czech army was high, he took an isolated sentence from a poorly written report from the British military attaché in Berlin as authority for stating that the morale of the Czechoslovak army was poor and the country would be overrun. Although General Maurice Gimlin, the French commander-in-chief, gave a very encouraging report on the Czech army and was quoted to this effort by Chamberlain in a cabinet meeting of September 26. Halifax the next day quoted him as saying that the Czech resistance would be of extremely brief duration. The military attaché in Prague protested about the statement in reference to Czech morale, pointing out that it was made in reference to the frontier police, which were not military. The military attaché in Paris questioned Lord Halifax's statement about Gamelin's views, and quoted contrary views from Gamelin's closest associates in the French army. The falsehood that Gamelin was defeatist was spread in the newspapers, and is still widely current. Just when the crisis was reaching the boiling point in September, the British ambassador in Paris reported to London that Colonel Charles A. Lindbergh had just emerged from Germany with a report that Germany had 8,000 military airplanes and could manufacture 1,500 a month. We now know that Germany had about 1,500 planes, manufactured 208 a month, in 1938, and had abandoned all plans to bomb London even in a war, because of lack of planes and distance from the target. Lindbergh repeated his tale of woe daily, both in Paris and in London, during the crisis. The British government began to fit the people of London with gas masks. The Prime Minister and the King called on the people to dig trenches in the parks and squares. School children began to be evacuated from the city. The Czechs were allowed to mobilize on September 24th, and three days later, it was announced that the British fleet was at its war stations. In general, every report or rumor which could add to the panic and defeatism was played up, and everything that might contribute to a strong or a united resistance to Germany was played down. By the middle of September, Bonnet was broken and Deladier was bending, while the British people were completely confused. By September 27th, the Ladier had caved in, and so had the British people. In the meantime, on September 13th, without consulting his cabinet, 
Chamberlain asked Hitler by telegraph for an interview. They met on September 15th at the Birchtest Garden. Chamberlain tried to reopen at once the discussion toward a general Anglo-German settlement, which Halifax had opened in November 1937, but which had been broken off since Nivelle Henderson's conference with Hitler on March 3rd. Hitler interrupted to say that he must have self-determination for the Sudeten Germans at once, and that the Czech-Soviet treaty must be abolished. If he did not get these, there would be an immediate war. Chamberlain asked to be allowed to return to London to confer with the French and Lord Runciman. The Anglo-French Conference of September 18, 1938, saw the last glimmering of French resistance to British plans, chiefly from de la Dier. Chamberlain blamed Benes for Czechoslovakia's plight, while Lord Halifax repeated all the mistaken arguments about the hopelessness of the resistance and the improbability of Czechoslovakia being revived with its present boundaries even after a costly victory. Chamberlain excluded all possible solutions from discussion except partition. To him, the problem was to discover some means by preventing France from being forced into war as a result of her obligations, and at the same time to preserve Czechoslovakia and save as much of that country as was humanly possible. De La Dierre feebly tried to get the discussion to the real problem, German aggression. Eventually he accepted the British solution of partition of all areas of Czechoslovakia with over 50% Germans and a guarantee for the rest. As he yielded on the main issue, de la Dier tried to get certain concessions. 1. That the Czechs must be consulted. 2. That the rump of Czechoslovakia should be guaranteed by Britain as well as others. 3. That economic aid should be extended to this rump. The last was rejected. The second was accepted on the understanding that Czechoslovakia give up its alliance and generally do what Britain wanted in issues involving war and peace. The first was accepted. The way in which Chamberlain applied consultation with the Czechs before partition was imposed is an interesting example of his mind at work. The British, French, and Czechs were agreed in opposition to the use of a plebiscite in this dispute although the Entente suggested it to put pressure on the Czechs. Chamberlain said, The idea of territorial cession would be likely to have a more favorable reception from the British public if it could be represented as the choice of the Czechoslovak government themselves, and it could be made clear that they had been offered the choice of a plebiscite or of territorial cession, and had preferred the latter. This would dispose of any idea that we were ourselves carving up Czechoslovak territory. He felt it particularly important to show that the Czechoslovak government preferred cession because they were so defiantly opposed to a plebiscite, that they would fight rather than accept a plebiscite. This Anglo-French decision was presented to the Czechoslovak government at 2 a.m. on September 19th to be accepted at once. The terms leaked to the press in Paris the same day. After vigorous protests, the Czechoslovaks rejected the Anglo-French solution and appealed to the procedures of the German-Czechoslovak Arbitration Treaty of 1926. The Czechs argued that they had not been consulted, that their constitution required that their parliament be consulted, that partition would be ineffective in maintaining peace because the minorities would rise again and that the balance of power in Europe would be destroyed. Benes refused to believe the new guarantees could be more effective when Czechoslovakia would be weaker than those which were now proving inadequate. London and Paris rejected the Czech refusal. Pressure was increased on the Czechs. The French threatened to revoke the French-Czechoslovak alliance and to abandon the whole country to Germany if the Anglo-French solution was not accepted. The British added that the Sudeten would not be returned to Czechoslovakia even after a successful war against Germany. The British ministry in Prague threatened to order all British subjects from the country if he did not receive an immediate acceptance. 
the Czechoslovak government accepted at 5 p.m. on September 21st. Lord Halifax at once ordered the Czech police to be withdrawn from the Sudeten districts and expressed his wish that the German troops move in at once. The next day, September 22nd, Chamberlain took the Czech acceptance to Hitler at Godsberg on the Rhine. He found the Fuhrer in a vile temper receiving messages every few minutes about the atrocities being inflicted on the Sudentans by the Czechs. Hitler now demanded self-determination for the Hungarians, Poles, and Slovaks in Czechoslovakia, as well as for the Sudentans. He insisted that he must have the Sudenten area at once. After that, if the Czechs challenged his choice of a frontier, he would hold a plebiscite and prove how wrong they were. An international commission could supervise the vote. At any rate, he must have the German areas before October 1st, for on that day the German forces would move in. War or no war. At Chamberlain's request, he embodied his demands in a memorandum, which proved to be an ultimatum. This ultimatum was at once carried to Prague, to be presented to the Czechs by the British military attaché. Back in London, the cabinet agreed to reject the Godsberg demands and to support France if it had to go to war as a result. The French cabinet also rejected these demands. So did the new Czech cabinet under General Jan Sorvi. The Soviet Union explicitly recognized its commitments to Czechoslovakia and even promised to come to the aid of the Czechs without the necessary preliminary action by France if the case were submitted to the League of Nations. This was to prevent Britain and France from charging Russia with aggression in any action it might take in behalf of Czechoslovakia. On the same day, September 23rd, Russia warned Poland that it would denounce their non-aggression treaty if Poland attacked Czechoslovakia. Apparently, a united front had been formed against Hitler's aggression, but only apparently. Mr. Chamberlain was already beginning to undermine the unity and resolution of this front, and he now received considerable assistance from Bonnet in Paris. This culminated on September 27th, when he made a speech on the radio, in which he said, quote, How horrible, fantastic, incredible it is that we should be digging trenches and trying on gas masks here, because of a quarrel in a faraway country between people of whom we know nothing. A quarrel that has already been settled in principle. Close quote. The same day he sent a telegram to Benes that if he did not accept the German demands by 2 p.m. the following day, September 28th, Czechoslovakia would be overrun by the German army and nothing could save it. This was immediately followed by another message that in such a case, Czechoslovakia could not be reconstituted in its frontiers, whatever the outcome of the war. Lastly, he sent another note to Hitler. In this he suggested a four-power conference and guaranteed that France and Britain would force Czechoslovakia to carry out any agreement if Hitler would only abstain from going to war. At 3 p.m. on Wednesday, September 28th, Chamberlain met Parliament for the first time during the crisis to inform it of what had been done. The whole city of London was in a panic. The honorable members sat haunched on their benches, waiting for Goring's bombs to come through the roof. As Chamberlain drew to the end of his long speech, a message was brought to him. He announced that it was an invitation to a four-power conference at Munich on Thursday. There was a roar of joy and relief as Chamberlain hurried from the building without any formal ending to the session. At Munich, Hitler, Chamberlain, Mussolini, and Deladier carved up Czechoslovakia without consulting anyone, least of all the Czechs. The conference lasted from 12.30 p.m. on September 29th to 2.30 a.m. When the agreement of the four powers was handed to the Czech minister in Berlin, who had been waiting outside the door for over ten hours. The agreement reached Prague only eighteen hours before the German occupation was to begin. 
The Munich Agreement provided that certain designated areas of Czechoslovakia would be occupied by the German army in four stages from October 1st to October 7th. A fifth area to be designated by an international commission would be occupied by October 10th. No property was to be withdrawn from these areas. The International Commission would order plebiscites, which must be held before the end of November, the areas designated being occupied by an international force during the interval. The same International Commission was to supervise the occupation and draw the final frontier. For six months, the populations concerned would have the right of option into and out of the areas transferred under the supervision of a German Czechoslovak Commission. The rump of Czechoslovakia was to be guaranteed by France and Britain. Germany and Italy would join this guarantee as soon as the Polish and Hungarian minority problems in the state had been settled. If they were not settled in three months, the four powers would meet again to consider the problem. The Munich Agreement was violated on every point in favor of Germany, so that ultimately the German army merely occupied the places it wanted. As a result, the Czech economic system was destroyed, and every important railroad or highway was cut or crippled. This was done by the International Commission, consisting of German Secretary of State Weissacker and the French British, Italian, and Czech diplomatic representatives in Berlin. Under dictation of the German general staff, by a four-to-one vote, accepted every German demand and canceled the plebiscites. In addition, the guarantee of the rump of Czechoslovakia was never given. Although Poland seized areas in which the majority of the population was not Polish on October 2nd and Hungary was given southern Slovakia, on November 2nd. The final frontier with Germany was dictated by Germany alone to the Czechs, the other three members of the commission having withdrawn. Benes resigned as president of Czechoslovakia under the threat of a German ultimatum on October 5th and was replaced by Emil Haja. Slovakia and Ruthenia were given complete autonomy at once. The Soviet alliance was ended and the Communist Party outlawed. The anti-Nazi refugees from Sudentenland were rounded up by the Prague government and handed over to the Germans to be destroyed. All these events showed very clearly the chief result of Munich. Germany was supreme in Central Europe, and any possibility of curtailing that power, either by a joint policy of the Western powers with the Soviet Union and Italy, or by finding any openly anti-German resistance in Central Europe itself, was ended. Since this was exactly what Chamberlain and his friends had wanted, they should have been satisfied.